Welcome back to the deep dive. Now, if you work in the procedure room, you handle endoscopes every day. And the, you know, they look sort of straightforward, right? It's a flexible tube, camera on the end. But uh, beneath that simplicity, it's really a marvel of precision engineering. Those specs, they're like a secret code. They absolutely are. And for you, the nurses and technicians on the front lines, getting those subtle differences, that's everything. You know, you look at two scopes, they might seem almost identical, but those tiny numbers, they can be the difference between a procedure going smoothly or, well, becoming a real high stakes struggle. Exactly, which is why we're doing this deep dive. We've been digging into Dr. Raju's excellent materials, his companion book info, and those really clear YouTube videos he does. Our mission today, to give you a quick practical guide so you can instantly read that design language on any scope you pick up. Yeah, because these numbers, they aren't just, you know, specs for the engineers. They're basically your blueprints for keeping things safe and efficient in the room. Every single one relates directly back to the patient, maybe preventing a tear or clearing out a massive bleed super fast. Okay, let's jump right in then. Before yeah. we hit the numbers, maybe we should quickly outline the main players, the different types of scopes. You could think of it like uh, picking the right vehicle for the landscape you're exploring. Good analogy. So we mainly classify them by where they're designed to go in the GI tract. First up, you've got the gastroscope. That's your tool for the upper GI esophagus, stomach, and that first bit of the small bowel, the duodenum. Right. Then the colonoscope, built yeah. obviously for the large intestine, needs to be long, needs to be maneuverable for that journey. Mm -hmm. And if you need to go deeper into the small bowel proper, the jejunum, the ileum, that's where the enteroscope comes in, much longer reach. And last but definitely not least, the specialist. The duodenoscope. You see this a lot with ERCPs. It's got that unique side viewing camera, right? Designed specifically for working near the bile and pancreatic ducts. The view dictates its job. Precisely. The design serves the specific task. Okay, so we know the main types. Now let's get into those five critical design features. Understanding these is probably the fastest way for techs and nurses to level up their game, ensuring everything's set up right for patient care. Absolutely. Let's start with number one, working length. So working length, pretty straightforward. It's the maximum distance the scope can actually functionally travel inside the patient, safely, of course. And the numbers tell you immediately what they're for. Gastroscopes are the shortest, usually around, what, 103 to 110 centimeters? That's the typical range, yeah. And colonoscopes, they obviously need more reach. You're looking at maybe 133 up to about 168 centimeters, sometimes even a bit more. And the enteroscopes, the deep explorers, they start at 200 centimeters, sometimes quite a bit longer. Exactly. And what's really interesting here is how that length gives you options, clinically speaking. Mm -hmm. Say you need to reach the jejunum, but maybe the dedicated enteroscope isn't available or it feels like overkill for the maneuver needed. Right. Well, a particularly long colonoscope, one at the upper end of that range, can often step in. It's about knowing the tool's capability and using it smartly. Does that work the other way around too? Like if you know a patient has a really long twisty colon, maybe post-surgery, would you ever grab an enteroscope just for that extra length to make sure you complete the colonoscopy? Oh, definitely. That's exactly the kind of skilled problem solving that comes from really understanding the specs. If the patient's anatomy screams difficulty ahead, you leverage the design of a longer scope. It's not just making do, it's a calculated choice based on the numbers. Okay, next up, insertion tube diameter. This is the actual width of the scope, usually in millimeters. And for the tech prepping the instruments, this feels like the most critical safety spec, wouldn't you say? It's right up there. And the variation can be pretty significant. Gastroscopes, you can find super slim ones, like 4.9 millimeters all the way up to your standard, more robust 10.9 millimeters. And colonoscopes, similar range, but different numbers. Slim ones around 9.5 millimeters, pediatric maybe 11.8, and the standard adult size is about 12.8 millimeters, give or take. Right. But the real danger, as you know, isn't just picking one that's generally too big. It's about matching it to the specific anatomy you might encounter in that patient. Let's say you have a patient with a known esophageal stricture, a tight scarred spot, maybe only eight millimeters wide. You absolutely cannot force a standard 10.9 millimeter gas scope through that. Exactly. That's asking for trouble, a perforation. Exactly. The risk of tearing tissue is just too high. The immediate professional move is to reach for that slimmer model, that five millimeter scope maybe, ensures safe passage. 
And this applies everywhere. If you're dealing with a narrowed section in the colon, maybe from scar tissue after surgery or really bad diverticulosis, you often have to switch to a pediatric colonoscope. That slightly smaller diameter, maybe 11.8 millimeter, is often mandatory for safety. So choosing the smaller diameter scope isn't just about patient comfort, though that's part of it. It's fundamentally about preventing a serious complication when you know the anatomy is compromised. And often, that's a call you, the nurse or tech, make before the procedure even starts based on the patient history. That's right. It's proactive safety based on understanding the tool's physical dimensions. All right, let's move inside the scope now to the working channel. This is that hollow tunnel running down the middle, right, for suction, water, passing instruments through. Exactly. And its diameter, that's basically your indicator of, well, raw power, especially mm. suction power. Okay. So a typical gastroscope, what's the channel size there? Like 3.2 to 3.7 millimeters. Yeah. That's a common range for standard diagnostic scopes. But when you look at the scopes designed for more heavy-duty work, like a duodenoscope for ERCP or a specific therapeutic gastroscope, that channel often jumps up significantly often to 4.2 millimeters. And that doesn't sound like much, less than a millimeter difference. You'd think so. But clinically, in an emergency, that difference can be absolutely life-saving. Picture this, an acute upper GI bleed, the stomach is just filling up with thick blood clots, fast. Yeah, nightmare scenario. You oh. can't see anything, can't find the bleeding source, you're fighting the clock. Precisely. And that's where the 4.2 millimeter channel becomes the hero. It provides dramatically more suction power. You can clear those clots, clear the view, literally in moments instead of minutes. When someone's bleeding heavily, those minutes matter immensely. So in that crisis, the working channel size. That becomes the single most important factor for how quickly your team can actually see the problem and intervene. You prioritize that power. So in a bleed situation, you specifically ask for or grab the scope with the bigger channel, even if it means the overall scope is a bit thicker. Absolutely. You trade off maybe a little bit of insertion ease for that critical suction capability. It's a calculated decision based on the urgency. Okay, feature number four, field of view or FOV. This is measured in degrees and it's just how wide the camera can see, right? I always picture it like switching from a really narrow flashlight beam to a big, wide floodlight. That's a perfect way to put it. And you see differences here, too. Gastroscopes, they usually offer maybe 120 to 140 degrees of view, but colonoscopes, they're often engineered for a much wider perspective. You'll frequently see 170 degrees on a modern colonoscope. Why the extra width specifically in the colon? Is it just about moving faster during withdrawal, covering more ground? Speed is part of it, sure, but the main driver is really about detection, finding pathology. That wider FOV means you're inspecting more of the mucosal surface with every little movement. This is absolutely critical for spotting those small, flat polyps, the ones that like to hide just behind a fold or hostra in the colon. Ah, okay, so the wider view literally helps you peek around corners better, reducing the chance you'll miss something important during a screening or surveillance exam. Exactly. It's engineered specifically to maximize visualization in that complex, folded environment. See more, miss less. That's the goal. All right, our fifth and final key feature, tip angulation. This is all about how much the very tip of the scope can bend and flex up, down, left, right. This is where the mechanics get pretty cool. Yeah, it looks impressive, almost like acrobatics, but these movements are pure function. They're designed very specifically to let you reach anatomical spots that would otherwise be blind. Take gastroscopes, for example. Many standard ones boast up to 210 degrees of upward flexion. That's a huge bend. And that extreme bend is what enables that classic retroflexion maneuver, right? Where you basically turn the camera around to look back at where you just came from. I heard a tech once call it parking the camera on the ceiling of the stomach. Kind of goofy, but it captures the idea. It really does. You're looking back up at the fundus, the upper dome of the stomach, and the cardia right where the esophagus joins. These are areas where things like subtle ulcers or even small masses can hide if you only look straight ahead as you go down. Retroflexion is crucial for a complete exam. Okay. And then you mentioned the duodenoscope earlier, the ERCP scope. Its angulation is different, isn't it? It is. While it needs good general movement, it's specifically engineered for very strong downward deflection. That precision is absolutely vital for the core task of ERCP, which is cannulating carefully guiding instruments into those tiny openings for the bile and pancreatic ducts. The angulation is built for that specific delicate job. So again, the mechanics, the degree of bend, it's all dictated by the procedure it's designed for, not just fancy engineering. Exactly. Purpose-driven design. 
Okay, so we've broken down the five key specs. Length, diameter, channel size, field of view, and angulation. But I guess the crucial point is that these don't exist in isolation, right? In the real world, they all interact. There are trade-offs. Absolutely. That's the reality of engineering and clinical use. Every design choice involves balancing possibilities against limitations. You can't always maximize everything at once. Like you mentioned the diameter. If you choose a super thin scope, yes, it's gentler, maybe easier to pass through a tight spot, but the trade-off is almost always a smaller working channel, which means weaker suction, maybe limits the size of biopsy forceps you can use. Precisely. And the flip side, if you absolutely need that powerful suction, like in the bleeding scenario, you demand that 4.2 millimeter channel. You get the power, but that inherently makes the overall scope thicker. So it might be a bit stiffer, potentially harder to navigate really sharp turns or loops in the colon. Right. And even angulation, you mentioned it briefly. Being able to bend the tip dramatically is great for viewing. But sometimes, when you really crank that angulation to the maximum, it can slightly pinch or stretch the working channel internally, temporarily, reducing suction flow just a little bit right at that moment. Exactly. These are the nuances. The real skill, whether you're the physician driving the scope, or the nurse, or tech, anticipating the needs and preparing the equipment, mm. is not just knowing the numbers, but understanding these inherent trade-offs. It's about selecting the best compromise for the specific patient and the specific task. Maybe we can run through those clinical snapshots again, just to really nail down how these specs drive decisions. Yeah, good idea. Let's take case A, the heavy suction situation again. ER calls, patient has an acute upper GI bleed, stomach's full of clots. As the nurse or tech prec in hearing that report, What's your immediate thought process regarding scope choice? My first thought is power. Forget the standard diagnostic scope for now. I know we need maximum suction immediately. So I'm heading straight for the therapeutic gastroscope or maybe even the duodenoscope if that's what's available with the 4.2 millimeter channel. The absolute priority is clearing that view fast. We're consciously sacrificing maybe a bit of slimness or flexibility for that critical channel size. It's a direct trade-off dictated by the emergency. Okay, now case B. Seeing behind folds. The goal is a really thorough stomach inspection, maybe looking for tiny polyps or subtle signs of early cancer. The physician specifically mentions wanting good retroflexion. Right. That word retroflexion is the trigger. As the support staff, you immediately know you need a gastroscope with that full 210 degree upward angulation capability. You select that specific model because of its angulation spec, ensuring the physician can perform that maneuver effectively to examine the fundus and cardia properly. The design feature directly enables the clinical goal of complete visualization. Makes sense. And finally, KC deep exploration needed, but the go-to scope is busy. Let's say you urgently need to examine the small bowel, maybe check for a bleed source down there. But the enteroscope, the specialized long scope, is currently in use in another procedure room. What happens then? This is where knowing the specs becomes real problem solving. Instead of just saying, we can't do it now, the experienced tech or nurse thinks about alternatives. They know that some colonoscopes have a working length of, say, 168 centimeters. That's significantly longer than a gastroscope. So you suggest trying the long colonoscope. It might just have enough reach to get to the target area in the junum. It's about leveraging the known specs of available equipment to avoid unnecessary delays. So understanding that length spec allows the team to adapt, to potentially use a tool off-label, but effectively, based on its inherent capabilities, that really does move beyond just prepping equipment. It's being part of the clinical strategy. Exactly. It's about being a knowledgeable partner in the procedure. Hashtag tag outro. So wrapping up this deep dive, I think the big takeaway is that endoscope specifications, they're definitely not just random numbers or technical trivia. Not at all. Yeah. They are quite literally the language of safe and effective endoscopy. Every single one of those specs we talked about, length, diameter, channel, view, angulation, translates directly into a decision that impacts patient comfort, safety, and the success of the procedure. And really mastering this language, understanding what those numbers mean in practical terms, it transforms you. It takes you from being just proficient to being a truly expert clinician or technician. It builds that confidence, that ability to quickly see the situation, assess the patient's anatomy, and know exactly which tool is the right fit for that specific moment. Mm. Well said. Those design details really are patient care, just expressed numerically. So maybe the final thought for everyone listening is this. The next time you pick up a scope, prepping it for a case, don't just see the instrument itself. Ask yourself, what's its real story?
Which hidden feature, which number on that spec sheet tells you the most about what this particular tool is truly designed to achieve? Is it the reach, the view, the power, or that incredible precision in its movement? Thinking that way, it changes how you see the tools you work with every day.